If you read this Torah portion, like me, it's so filled with things that, from the surface, of, can I be honest with y'all? It's just boring. It's just flat boring. Not really. Yeah, it's boring. And unless you know what the Hebrew language says, it's boring. You can read it in the King James English all you want, and you will not see what we're going to see in the Hebrew language. And I'll just be honest with you. And I've read this saying 40, 11 times. I know that Yahweh has something hidden in here for you every time you come around. And as I was looking at this week's Torah portion, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm the lucky one. I got Emor this week. And if you've never studied or never taught this Torah portion, you don't understand what I'm, what I'm getting at. But some of you folks have had the opportunity to teach these portions, you know. Can I find anything new in that portion? Well, Yahweh is the one who makes his mercies new every morning. His word's new. It's refreshing. And there's some things in here that I promise you is going to teach you about your personal relationship with him because it's all about individuals that are going to attempt to come before the presence of the king in order to worship him. And they have ritual, physical, blemishes, impurities, and imperfections in them. Did you know that he's just got through speaking to you? Every one of us in here has those physical blemishes, ritual imperfections, some peculiarities that if it were not for the moving of his presence in our lives, we would not be allowed to go before the king. Isn't that amazing? Well, this Torah portion, Emor, I've kind of, I have a subtitle, and the subtitle is The Priestly Bride. And you'll find that that's exactly who we being talked to here. And the word Amar, or Emor, is rendered literally, as I said earlier, to speak, to say, or utter. But the more, in my opinion, appropriate definition indicates that when one is about to speak or utter, they're literally going to bear forth or bring something to the light. I want you to remember that. Because if you understand who's being addressed here, you realize that Abba Yahweh is speaking to Moses and he's about to speak specifically to Aaron and Aaron's sons. I want you to remember that. He's not talking to all of the Levites here. He's not talking to the whole house of Israel. He's actually specifically speaking to the Kohanim in this particular uh, verse we're about to look at. And so if you want to, uh, you don't really have a choice. I'm going to just go ahead on. I'm going to do it for you. We're going to look at that word for priest here. Because the word priest also identifies who you are. And when you read that, it's the word Cohen. And again, it's loosely translated as an individual who serves as a priest, a minister. He's in a priestly function. He's the one that uh, kind of officiates, if you will, before the presence of Allah Yahweh. But it literally comes from a primitive root. And that primitive root is hard to trace. But if you're willing to dig it out, you'll find it actually comes from a Kaf Vav Noon root. And when you look at that Kaf Vav Noon root, it's actually hinting at something that's being established or set up, straightened or directed. And so it's literally speaking of the role of the priest, not so much the, the man. And if you remember, the Hebrew language is prophetic, okay? And so if I was to call you a Kohanim, I would be saying of you that your future, your life is going to be centered around this vocation. And the vocation will require that you stand upright before the face of Yahweh. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now, don't we really enjoy calling ourselves the house of Israel? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yes. Well, if you ever look at the word Israel, and that's a major disconnect for a lot of our church brothers because replacement theology kind of uh, got interspersed in a lot of the theology and the doctrine that the traditional church teaches. And the church has taught that they replaced Israel. And they don't understand literally who Israel is. If they understood who Israel was, then they would say, no, 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 no. That's us. It's us. Well, the word Israel, Yeshar El, is how it's literally rendered, comes from a root that also means to stand upright, to stand erect before the king, to be upright in front of his face. Listen to that. And so there's a connection here being made between the house of Israel, who as a whole were supposed to stand up right before him. And if you go back and look at it, and we will in just a few moments, you'll find that Yahweh said that the house of Israel as a whole were supposed to be a nation of priests and kings. And I can remember for the last 30 years in the Christian community that we also were quickly uh, just fond of saying that we were kings and priests before him. How many of you have ever heard that? Well, if we are kings and priests, then this, is, this particular Torah portion 
question is being addressed to you. And you're one of those who's supposed to carry the light. You're to bring forth the light. And he's speaking again to the sons of Aaron. And if you remember that word Aaron there, loosely translated means a light bringer. I want you to think about that for a second. If you really want to understand what that word of wrong means, you have to begin to focus on the role of this person. And again, there's a major disconnect when we realize we start thinking in our roles as individuals. I think of myself in the manly role, the masculine role. You ladies think of yourselves in a feminine role, and we forget that in him there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. As men, we can also play a, a feminine role, and as ladies, you can play a masculine role because we're part of the body, and also we're the bride of Messiah. Does that make sense to you? Okay, I want to be careful here. I don't want to trip you up. But if you understand that as an alone, as part of the Kohanim, the priestly brotherhood, that we're supposed to bring the light. It literally is implying that we're to wound the light. Now think about that for a second. The word of Yahweh, His light, and they're synonymous, they're supposed to be inside of us. His word is seed, and if you're listening to His word, you're literally impregnated with His yeah. light or His yeah. word, and wherever you go, you're to bear forth, yeah. to shine forth, you're to carry His womb inside His womb, and literally it is His womb, you're to carry inside of you the word, the light of Yahweh, which literally is an indicator of his presence. You should be a changer. Did you understand that? It might be kind of a crude analogy. But you're to be one that changes circumstances. You go into a place and you understand that men love darkness rather than light. And so if you go outside an area where people are walking in the light and you go out into the regular world... In where there are carnal things being demonstrated, then you're supposed to shine the light in the midst of darkness. Amen? And so you find here that it's Aaron and his sons that are being amarred, and they're being spoken to, and they are receptacles, they're containers of the word of Yahweh. And I have here again, word is seed. Say that with me. Word is seed. And so if I were to address you in the fashion that's being spoken here in this title part of this portion, and I would say, speak or eat more, I'm literally commanding you to release or to bring someone or something to the light as, being, as it is being discussed here. Today we would call this verbal intercourse. You're speaking word, I'm hearing it. I'm speaking word, you're hearing it. Word's being released, it's being received. That's why you're admonished to be careful to measure everything you hear for the way that you measure will determine how it's measured back into you. You're commanded to take captive every thought. Why? Because there are more than one voice in the world and the enemy will speak to you. And if you don't know how to cast down those thoughts that are against his word, then guess what? When you hear that word, it's seed nonetheless. When you hear the word of the enemy, something contrary to Yahweh's word, you just become impregnated. Now you need to think about it because that's, in my opinion, that's a dangerous situation to be in. Right? In my opinion, the role that's being identified here for the priesthood is remarkably similar to that of the role of Eve to Adam. In other words, the bride to her husband. And in order for you to understand that, you need to be able to see what her name literally indicates it. And honestly, I've researched, and I don't know where they ever come up with the word Eve. I don't. I'm open for uh, help here if you have an idea. But in Hebrew, we know the word is Chavah. Say that with me. Chavah. And she's called Chavah because she's described as being the mother of all living. And it does mean to make live, but it more literally indicates that she was to tell. She was to declare, she was to show, make known, to interpret, explain, inform, to exude breath. Whose breath? To inform people about whom, regarding whom. To make known who, to make known what, to interpret whom, to interpret what. Have you ever asked that question? This was her role. She was literally to receive the breath of the word, the seed of Adam in her, and she became his mirror, and she was to reflect everything that the Adam would say. That's the role of the Messiah, the husband, to his bride. We're a reflection of him. We're to explain. When the world wants to know about the redemption plan, they ought to be able to come to you, and you should be 
the Chava. You should be the Eve. You should be able to explain, reveal, make known, cause it to be brought forth in their life. You should literally be so impregnated that when they look at you, what do they often say about a woman who's, who you're able to tell when she's pregnant? Oh, she shows. She's showing. You see that? Why? When you look at her, you know that she she's, has seed within her. You know that she's pregnant. Does that make sense? Well, can I ask you a question? How many people can look at you and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've been impregnated with the Word of Yahweh? Hmm. Well, Matthew 12, 34 tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here's how people can tell. They can tell by what comes out of your mouth whatever has been planted inside you. Whatever was spoken, whatever you've entertained, whatever you've heard, and like it or not, there's more than one way to communicate. Right? So I just communicated to you and it didn't say a word, right? Yeah. Body language by time, expression, but neither of those are as important as word. And we used to have this little saying when I was a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's exactly opposite. You can recover from the wounds that you receive from sticks and stones, but words that are spoken over you, if you don't deal with them quickly, they will not only follow you throughout your, the course of your life, but they will begin to chart the life of those that come forth out of you. That's why Yahweh is trying to teach us something here. He's speaking to the priesthood. He's speaking to his bride, and he's trying to tell us something about how to approach him and what to do when we have already received blemishes. And we, for some of you, can I just get in your business? Some of you have been hearing some compromised words from the enemy, maybe from your own flesh, maybe your past. Like it or not, the past will follow you around like this shadow in the shadow of those. <laughs> and if you're not careful, that's just as real as if that person was standing alongside of you. We've got to learn how to deal with these issues. I see people in the Hebrew Roots community, one of the major things that I find that keeps us from being able to function the way that Father calls us to function is our self-image, how we perceive ourselves. If you can see yourselves as a, just an old grub worm, an old sinner saved by grace, just barely getting by, just going, if you make it in, it'll be just by the skin of your teeth, then that's how you're going to live. But if you can see that you're more than a conqueror, that you're yeah. an overcomer, that you've been called as the co-regent yeah. of the king in the earth, that you represent him, you may fall, but when you fall, you yeah. get right back up. You yeah. have the book. <laughs> These priests, when they receive the word of Yahweh, because that's the charge of the priest, and quite honestly, a lot of us think that we're just going to receive the word and sit back and chew on it for a while and not do anything with it. Well, guess what? Yesterday's manna gets stale. Right. Yeah. And so if you've heard a word from Yahweh, if you've dug something out from Yahweh and you're not doing anything with it, come on. You're not fulfilling your role as a priest because from what I can see, if you're be a priestly individual, then you have a command not only to receive it, but then you're to incubate it, nurture it for a season, and then release it in the lives of someone else. I want you to do me a favor. I want you just to raise your, put your hand in the area of your spiritual womb, and I want you to just do like this. Raise your hand up and say, let it go. Let it go. Just, just let, let it go. go. Just let that word go. It may be kind of flippant and casual, but I'm hoping that some analogy is going to stick with you. You've got to learn how to speak His Word. Let it go, at least it in somebody else's life. Amen. I know what your problem is. You can't speak in someone else's life if you can't speak in your own. And that's one of the first things that the enemy will tell you. you got some nerve telling this person that, you can be, that they can be healed when you're having problems yourself. Hello? Hello? We've got to learn how to speak the, the word of Yahweh and just get in the face of the enemy. I shared with someone just a couple of days ago, and I said, you know what? I felt like Yahweh is telling us is that we've got to get past these defensive postures that we've taken. Yeah. I'm tired. How many of you remember when Muhammad Ali fought, and one of the tactics he used was called rope-a-dope years ago. 
He got on the rope and he just allowed George Foreman to beat him for round after round after round after round. And finally, when George Foreman got tired, then Muhammad Ali come out, come along and knock the man out. Well, you're not Muhammad Ali. And I got news for you. You're not fighting George Foreman. You're fighting an entity that does not get tired. And sooner or later, if you're on the defense and you're taking that rope and dope posture and you think that you're going to keep the enemy from hitting you, sooner or later, your arms are going to get tired and you're going to get a head shot. Yeah. Might do some yeah. of us good. <laughs> but my point is, is that we've got to stop fighting defensive battles and go on the offense. If you read Yahweh's word, you'll find his word is an offensive word. Yeah. You're supposed to take the sword of his word and charge. You're supposed to go with it. Amen? Amen. Praise Yahweh. Let's look at some of these priestly specifications. I've got a lot of territory to cover. So we're going to be here. you got to help me. We're going to be here long. If you look at what we've been talking to you about regarding these instructions, and these instructions are towards the bride, and then evidently she's, she's supposed to indulge herself in these instructions. Look in Levit Leviticus 21 verse 1. There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. A lot of us preachers would be caught with that one. Hello? Say amen right there. Yeah. yeah. There shall be none defiled for the dead among his people, at least if you look at it from the King James English. And you see a short list of ritual exceptions that are provided, and if you look at it, you see that it seems as if physical and ritual purity affects the priestly role. Am I right? They do. These blemishes seem to, if, to affect the role of the, the bride, the priestly role. And if you can understand it, her role, the priest's role, was to be the one who's intimate with Yahweh. And so if you want intimacy with Yahweh, you cannot have any of these blemishes in you. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. Let none be defiled for the dead. The word defiled there is the word tame. It means to become unclean, impure. It literally indicates to be impure sexually. It can indicate impure religiously or ceremonially. And if you look at the word, it's closely associated with something or someone who profanes their relationship with their husband in an adulterous or harlot's relationship. Now you think about that. Anytime we entertain pagan deities, anytime, anytime we entertain things that are in the flesh, we have just profaned the role of the, the bride and we've either become a harlot or a whore. You can give it away or sell it. Do you hear what I said? It's kind of crude, but that's exactly the category that we find ourselves in. And then it says, don't be defiled for the dead. Now this was where it kind of got interesting because the word for dead here is the word nephish. There's, in my... And I've looked at this. In the Hebrew language, the word body is not there. It says, let none be defiled for the nephesh. It doesn't say dead either. It just happens that they translate it out of 750 times that this word nephesh is used. It's only translated dead five times. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've interpreted this as meaning we get defiled by touching a dead body, right? Well, doesn't a dead body mean that it's the one that's absent of the nephesh, absent of life? Yes. The life is in the blood, right? Yes. And so if you have a dead body, how can there be a nephesh in it? Right. And so how could I uh, explain this category where it says, don't be defiled by touching the nephesh? So when I run across that, it, kind of, it, it rocked me in my seat. I said, wait, wait, I gotta, I've got to figure this one out. And so... The word nephesh means the soul that which breathes his mind or heart to take the breath or to take a breath of something, something that's refreshed. And if you understand that, the first instance you see of it is in Genesis chapter 2 where Yahweh breathes his breath into the Adam and Adam becomes a living nephesh. Yeah. Can I just ask you a question? Do you think a nephesh then would have its origins in the breath of Yahweh? Yeah. You think maybe the nephesh, the, the, the soul, what causes me to exist is there simply because of the breath, the word of Yahweh that's released in me? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. If you look at the 
different numeric values in these two words. The word tame has a value of 50, which indicates jubilee and restoration. I thought, wow, that's odd, because what does being defiled have to do with being restored? Now, you have to look at how Yahweh is putting these things in the text so that you can see that when he juxtaposes something to another, then he's trying to teach you something in the process. The next thing you see is the word nefesh. It has a numeric value of 430. Whenever you see that number, 430, it's always associated with, with something that's in bondage, waste, and desolate, like tohu va bohu. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. That phrase, tohu va bohu, has a numeric value of 430. And when you look at it, the two numbers together, tame and nefesh, they imply that there's a period of exile for one who becomes impure. Isn't that what happens to the priest? If the priest gets impure, he has to exile himself for a while until he's cleansed. Am I correct? Now, I want you to think about something. Exile means you're just set apart from someone or others. Is it possible? I just want to throw this out. I'm going to move quickly. Is it possible that the breath of the nephesh of Yahweh is in, is in an exiled condition when it's in the body of an unclean person? I want you to think about it. Oh, I really don't know if that could be possible. Didn't Yeshua go down into Egypt? Wasn't Yeshua the word, the breath of Yahweh? When he went down into Egypt, wasn't it a, in a form of being exiled? Just think about it. Hmm. Yeah, we're in exile. And as I was saying, it seems that it's kind of odd that the word nephish would be used for dead here. That's just my opinion. I'm throwing it out. I want you to chew on it, ruminate on it for a little while and see what you come up with. It's only used five times to illustrate something that's dead or dying. And, and the other 750 times, it's translated something entirely else. And so I had to ask myself, how could the defilement that they're talking about here pertain to contact with a dead body because the dead body had no nephesh. And it seems that this warning is specific to any individual that would have contact with a, with a dead body. And yet, it, what it seems to me that it's not so, so much talking about a dead body because there's no nephesh there, as it's talking about coming in contact with someone that has an impure, unclean nephesh or so. Does that make sense? How can I touch a dead body or come in contact with a dead body? And I understand that there are some disease that can be transmitted through the contact of a dead body, but you can suffer a lot more disease and destruction when you come in contact with an individual that has an impure soul, an impure nephesh. Yes. 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 You see that? Yes. Hmm. Look at Leviticus 17, 14. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Now I thought, just so you wouldn't think that I had kind of fell off the tree limb here, I wanted to look at that word nephesh. And I went to Exodus chapter 31, verse 17b, and it's talking about Yahweh himself, and it says, For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. You know that word refresh is the same root? Nephesh? <laughs> so if I read that over there in Leviticus, where it talks about touching something that was dead, and I read this, and it should have been translated consistently, and it should say that Yahweh died on the seventh day. Hello? But it's, it's, it's translated refreshed here. You see the conundrum? With understanding the translations, you've got to go back and address these things properly. What, what I've found is that the Sabbath is actually a season that's there for the refreshing of the flesh, and the Sabbath is there as a, as a reminder of Yahweh's covenant promise to renew and restore the dead body. Can you see that? Are you confused yet? Are you hot? Because if it gets too warm in here, you'll go to sleep. Crack the door back here, you guys. And if one of you, my elders would stand up and just kind of move around and make sure nobody goes to sleep. I appreciate <laughs> What exactly is it that Yahweh's trying to tell these priests here? Go get them, brother. <laughs> Seriously. Has, has, did anybody see this before, besides me? If Yahweh tells me that I'm unclean if I touch a dead body and it doesn't say dead body here in the text, what is it talking about? And so I had to ask myself, and then I remember, and I want to convey that to you, that every Hebrew word has a blessing and a curse, life or death associated with it. 
So it's my opinion, anything without the breath or word of Yahweh in it becomes a dead thing. Say amen. amen. Is it possible that he's trying to teach them here about his word and its power? Is it? Is it possible that when the word of Yahweh is not being spoken, when the word of Yahweh is not being stored on the inside, that it makes for a dead body? Go to the next slide. Is that possible? Come on, raise your hand if you agree with me. If Yahweh's word's not inside here, then the nephesh inside here is dead. It's gone. There's nothing in it. So if if I don't have a relationship with Yahweh, can I be considered? I'm just throwing it out. Can I be considered a walking dead man? Yes. 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 I'm walking dead. You know, somebody should do a television program about that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You are right now. <laughs> Since nephesh means both life and death, as it's translated here, I'm throwing this out. Is it possible that both life and death can exist in the flesh and blood bodies? Yeah. In fact, we know from what Paul says in chapter 7 of Romans, verse 24, he cries out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And in another place, he says, I am crucified with the Messiah. Nevertheless, I live. Wait a minute. Contradictory. I'm crucified. It means I'm dead. Yet I live. Yet not I, but the life I live, I live because of the Messiah who lives in me. Can you see that what I'm telling you is in fact the truth? Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the what? Tongue. Wait a second. Whatever is spoken by the tongue that I hear has the ability to to cause me to live or die. Yeah, yeah. Whatever I speak out of my own mouth has the ability to cause me to live or die. Yeah. It also has the ability to affect the lives of other people. If you don't think so, you just start watching the words that have been coming out of your mouth for a long period of time. You'll find that you've got a nice, healthy crop going. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How many of you have things growing in your life that you're tired of and would like to see changed. Okay. Have you still got some of that same seed? If you do, you need to get rid of that because the seed you plant is going to you. you know? Yahweh said, calling those things that be not as though they were. He didn't say call those things that are as though they were not. And so if you've got these weed seed that's growing in your life and you still got some old sun set by and you're planning on planting the same weed seed again and you're going to get that same bad harvest, you can't call bad seed good. You've got to change the seed. You've got to change what you're planting. Say amen on me or choke. It's all the truth. Yahweh's word is real and you've got to learn how to start speaking his word. Holy. See what you learn. The numeric value of that word Lashon for tongue, by the way, the rabbis teach that if an individual had leprosy, it was because of an evil tongue. Isn't that odd? Wow. How an evil tongue can cause blemishes, impurities. If you look at the Lashon, Lamed Shin Nun, it has a numeric value of 380. And I thought, oh, isn't that amazing? Because if you were to go back and look at the dimensions of the ark that Noah built, you'd find that it had exactly the same dimensions. 300 by 50 by 30. What was the ark? It was a vessel that had life inside of it. It protected those inside of it from the death outside. Death and life were in the Lashon. Death and life was in the ark. Can you see that? That's what Yahweh's trying to teach us. And he goes on to say that those that love the tongue are going to eat the fruit of it. Yes. How many of you know people that love to talk? <laughs> Don't point up here. If you love to talk, prayerfully what's coming out of your mouth is life. Now this seems like an enigma, doesn't it? Life and death in the same place. I have death working in my flesh, my carnal body, but my inward man's being renewed day by day. There's another example, and I put it here in the notes. We're in Judges chapter 14 when Samson kills a lion, remember? And later he comes back, and in the dead carcass he finds honey, life, 
He finds bees. The Hebrew word for bees is Deborah, and it literally is a feminine rendering of the word Debar, which means his word. Yeah. And so right in the middle of this dead lion, I thought, where have I heard that before? The lion of the tribe of Judah who might die for us, and inside his dying would be life cultivated. Yeshua said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it cannot live. Are you beginning to see how even though it looks as if it's something that should stagger the imagination, Yahweh is trying to teach us that we can have what we say, life or death, in spite of what this dead flesh is telling me, the carnal habits that this dead flesh has, it can be overridden by the word of Yahweh that comes out of my mouth. Yeah. And it can affect my situation financially, physically, spiritually, mentally. It can change my situation. It does. Yes. It can change yours. It was ironic because when I... I had just let some of this soak in, and I thought, well, I'm going to look a little bit further, and it starts talking about baldness upon the head, and I thought, oh, wow. Now, isn't that odd that one of the imperfections here would be considered baldness? And whenever you teach on this, you have to be very careful because people can get intimidated when you start looking at what's being said here, but it's talking about an individual who would make themselves intentionally bald. In my opinion... In rebellion to what Yahweh is trying to teach here. And we're going to look at this real carefully. One of the principal individuals we remember that stood against Moshe and thus would be standing against Yahweh was Korah, right? Remember? His name is literally translated to be made or to make oneself bald. And the rabbis teach that Korah made himself bald after the role of the priest in Egypt. Pharaoh and all of his minions shaved their head. The Hebrews were to have long hair. The Hebrew men were to have their head covered. The Egyptians shaved theirs. Now I want you to remember that. And that's not an accident because even the word Pharaoh, if you look at the root of it, it literally, its root indicates hair. And if you see all of the pictures of all of the pharaohs, you'll find that they were shaved heads, shorn heads. Why? Why? What is Yahweh trying to talk about here? He goes on to tell you that they shouldn't make themselves bald or shave their heads in mourning. And I thought, there's something odd that's happening here. We need to be able to write and divide the word of truth. You're going to get yourself in trouble, okay? If you look, you'll find that Korah was a Levite. He was one of the priestly guys, but he was not a Kohanim. Let me make sure you understand that. Right. But he wanted to be a Kohanim. Yes. And he was attempting to intrude in the role of the Kohanim. Now, the, the role of the Kohanim, as compared to the rest of the priesthood, the rest of the priests had the privilege of ministering on behalf of Yahweh, but the Kohanim were the only ones that were allowed by proxy to go into the holiest of holies. I believe with all my heart that there's a representation of the bride and the Kohanim and the Levites being those that may not ascribe to some of the things that the Torah teaches, but yet they may have accepted Yahweh and Yeshua as their, their Savior. I'm just throwing that out for you to listen to and think about, okay? Korah, by the way, brings 250 men with him who were in rebellion. And if you go back and look at it, and I'm gonna, I want to show you something here. The numeric value of that number 250 is the same as the Hebrew word for light, near. And it's ironic because these guys get their light snuffed out. They're swallowed up in the earth. Am I correct? Yes. And it's not an accident that you see what's happening here because the men that were in rebellion with Korah were from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben in Hebrew is translated, behold, a son. You see that? So if you can remember that seed and light are synonymous and that the Kohanim were the one who were charged with wombing the light, so literally what's happening when the Kohanim comes before Yahweh, he's impregnated with the light and they're supposed to give birth. Am I right? Yeah. You see here that Korah and the 250 rebellious men with him like Nadab and Abihu, they bring their charges with strange fire. They're trying to counterfeit the fire, the seed, the word of Yahweh. I submit by being in rebellion. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. How I many of you have been rebellious in the house? 
you need to repent because rebellion is like unto the sin of witchcraft and you're literally bringing strange fire into the house. Yes. And if you bring strange fire in the house, you're attempting to produce a son, Reuben, with a counterfeit light and you're in danger of being swallowed up. Oh, that's a hard word. True. That's so hard. Stop crying. <laughs> it's hard. Well, the God of the Old Testament was a ruthless individual. We need this lovey-dovey stuff that Jesus yeah. preaches in the New Testament. Oh, if you go back and read the New Testament, it says, hmm, there was some sore punishment under the law of Moses. You had two witnesses, and if you were judged guilty there, you died. But how much sore punishment if we trod under foot, foot the blood of Messiah? It doesn't say anything else there about the two witnesses. It just says if you trod under foot the blood of Messiah. What tells me is that the punishment is much more worse for those of us who abrogate the proper relationship with Yahweh and His Word and deny His Word and wind up being in a rebellious state and will not adhere to the Torah of Yahweh. It's a dangerous position. Say amen. Amen. What follows in chapter 17 there, when we were looking at the rebellion of Korah, back there in Numbers, Yahweh says, well, here, we're going to put this thing to the test, and I want, I want you to listen to this. Are you all okay? Can we, can we have a little more time? If you get hot, I call you. Okay. Yahweh says, we're going to fix this situation. We're going to let the rest of the house of Israel know whom I have chosen. I want you to pay attention here because this pertains to you. You want the rest of the world to know that you've been chosen? There's a lot of people out there that say that they're following Him. And there's a lot of people out there that say that they're in an intimate relationship with Him. But if you want to really be the chosen one and everybody be able to see it, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have to have a budding rod. That's what it says. That's how they were able to prove who was the counterfeits. Aaron's rod abutted. The rod from the other 11 tribes did not. The word for budded here is the word parat. Listen to it. It means to break forth or break out like when a fetus issues forth from the root womb. Did you hear that? So there's something about being identified as the priest with being able to birth something. It budded and then it brings forth blossoms. The word for blossom here is the word zitz. You ever heard that? You probably heard the plural zitz, zitz. You ever heard that? Yes. Just this past week, we're in the middle of a discussion over zitz, zitz. Why should we wear zitz, zitz? Why not wear zitz, zitz? What's the purpose for wearing zitz, zitz? So everybody can see that I'm chosen. <laughs> right? The word zitz here means to flower or shine. Listen to me. If you go over to Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9, you'll see this word used. And I'm going to read it to you. And it's used to define something very intimate that's reserved only for the husband and his bride. If you're married and your wife's close by or your husband's close by, you're welcome to take their hand at the moment. I'll just indulge you for a moment. If you're not married, do not take the hand of the person sitting beside you. Okay. We want to make sure when we read this, we want to make sure when we read this, that you can have a proper perspective. All right, you watch me. And we're going to kind of have a little body language in this. So. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind our, our wall. He looks forth at the windows, showing zoots, zeets himself through the lattice. Did you hear that? Do I need to explain that? He is intimately revealing himself to his beloved. Did you hear that? Yes, yes. In the intimate, private place of the house, the husband is intimately, intimately revealing himself to his husband. His wife. What's happening here, when we wear the fringe, we should be identifying our intimacy with the king. If we're not wearing it for that reason, we have absolutely no, in fact, we should be ashamed for wearing it, okay? Yes. If we're not there to wearing it to reveal our intimacy with him. 
I found that when I read this, that only those with the rod of Aaron, listen to this, that word rod there is Mateus, means a branch or a tribe. It comes from the word Natah, it means those that stretch out, those that incline themselves. It indicates to turn, to turn aside. It means to turn away, to bow. And it really is connected with those that make Teshuvah, who return, who turn, who bow towards the Torah. The tribe that turns, makes a return, returns the Torah, makes Teshuvah, they're the one yes. that has the rod yes. of Aaron in the house. Does that wow. make sense? Yes. The rod of Aaron. Next. The rod of Aaron produced almonds. Look at that word, shaked. It means almonds, but it also indicates to wait or to stand watch at the threshold in order to guard it. If you understand threshold covenants, the highest form of a threshold covenant occurred at Passover. When the blood of the lamb was applied to the threshold, it was applied to the doorpost of the house to prevent the death angel from entering in. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Life and death are juxtaposed here. Did you know that the marriage covenant was a threshold covenant? You pick your bride up and you carry her across the threshold. What happens, husband, if you happen to come to your house and someone else has come across the threshold? Whose responsibility is it to stand at the threshold and guard it? I want you to think about that because you're going to see something in a few moments that is going to blow yourself out of that seat. Okay? You have a marriage covenant. Proverbs 8.34 says, Blessed is the man that hears me, watching Shekhar daily at my gates, waiting at the post, the mezuzah of my doors. That word door there is patach. It means to open the mouth, waiting when I, for me to utter, to speak, to speak the words there, the, the threshold, waiting for the words to come across the threshold. Are you beginning to see it's about husband and wife relationship? It sounds like those that are returning to Torah at present are the ones that are hearing these words. Okay? Let me get, I'm trying to speed up. I've got a lot of ground to cover. You need to remember while we're looking at it that this tour portion occurs in the middle of the Omer, the counting of the Omer. Omer and Omer are etymologically the same word. Counting could also be speaking. The root comes from the word which means to bind, press, squeeze together. And it's a picture of Echad, the two becoming one. You're in the counting of the Homer. We're getting the imperfections out. We're getting everything out of our lives that keep us from being hindered from going into the presence of the king at Shavuot. We, we the hero, the speaker, we become one. And if you understand that these restrictions are here so that the priest can represent the bride properly and the bride can represent the priesthood properly, and you're to understand what's expected of you physically, spiritually, and ritually, that you are not to be blemished, then you'll understand you have a role, and that role is to reflect your husband, Yahweh. And that's why I appreciated the songs that were, we were singing earlier. We're talking about Kadosh, being holy. We're talking about His name. If you understand what Kadosh literally means, if you just change the vowel points, it's the word Kadesh, and it means a prostitute. And so if you play with the holiness of Yahweh, you can literally be considered a temple prostitute. You see that? Now look at this. The woman's hair, in this instance, we're talking about the bride, the priesthood, male or female. We're talking about the person's hair. The bride's hair has a spiritual connection to her relationship with her husband as her covering. That's why Israel was charged not to make themselves bald because Israel was married to Yahweh, having their head with the, the hair on the head indicating that they were there in submission to the one who had authority over them. You see that? Yeah. Isaiah 3, 16 and 24, adultery and wanton promiscuity warranted the shaving of a person's head. The above picture of the omer represented the first heads of grain whose locks were bound and they are contrasted with the heart of their slave whose head would have been shown. Did you see that? The counting of the owner was a full head. It's a shadow picture of the bride whose hair adorned her head and she's bound together with a scarlet thread, a sheet that would be waved before the king. 
And if you go back and look at Israel's place in, in Egypt, you'll find they had prostituted themselves to the Egyptian gods, specifically Pharaoh. Pharaoh is normally translated as his great house, but if you begin to understand in Hebrew what the name really means, it indicates that Pharaoh's house was a bald head, a head that had been shorn because of idolatry, which was harlotry. And there's a connection there with the word Pharaoh and hair, but also the word peri, which means whatever's spoken out of your mouth. Did you see that? He played a hard role with his gods. And it's interesting, if you go back and look at the life of Joseph, when Joseph was brought out of bondage, what was Joseph first commanded to do? Shave your head. If you want to go before the Pharaoh, you're going to have to shave your head. How many of you have ever heard, had the enemy say something to you that way? You understand what I'm talking about? Bowing your knees to the gods of this world. Yahweh's trying to teach us about proper submission. Chapter 21 of Leviticus finishes with additional information regarding how blemishes restricted access to the husband, the creator. Can I ask you a question? Are those blemishes still in effect? Are those restrictions, those prohibitions still in effect? Yes, they are. We just know that he always has a remedy for us. And you see it there in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, it talks about the relationship of a wife to her husband. She should be in submission to her own husband. Say amen right there. Amen. Husband, turn to your wife and tell him you ain't got no business being submitted to someone else's husband. That's what it says. And didn't I tell you that we all play a dual role? So whose husband are you submitted to? Your own Yahweh? Or have you submitted yourself to the pagan idolatrous gods that you have called your husband? You could have called them that if you want to, but that didn't make them your husband. It just means you were kind of frivolous. You get me? The wife of priesthood submits to her husband. It is accepted that today's bride, because of the physical condition of many of us, that we have blemishes. But it's interesting because he said that he would remove the blemishes, the spots and wrinkles. Yes. Praise Yahweh. The fountain of youth can be found in a relationship with the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. One final verse in Leviticus 21, verse 9, and we're going to move quickly. I've been told I've got 50 minutes and I've got ways to go. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, She's profaned her father. She shall be burnt by fire. You ever read that before? Aren't we called the priesthood? Isn't Yeshua the priest? Isn't Yahweh himself functioning in the role as priest? Really? Because he's a mediator between his word and his people. So he functions in that role. Our father is the priest. And so if we are his daughter, stroke wife, and we profane ourselves to other gods, then aren't we then guilty of playing the harlot? And don't we deserve to be burned with fire? Well, I just don't really believe there's a hell that burns with fire. A hell was created for the whores that profaned the yes. relationship. Yes. That's what the, the Torah teaches you. Yes. That's why Judah said, Tamar needs to be burned because she's played the harlot. Remember the story? Yes. Come to find out, it wasn't Tamar that was in the fault. However, Judah was right in his judgment of the situation to begin with because Tamar was a daughter of the priest. And so be, she was supposed to be burned with fire as a process. Amen? Chapter 23 is kind of interesting. Chapter 21, 22 is all about these prohibitions. And then all of a sudden, Yahweh stops, inserts something parenthetically into the text. And it's called the dissertation on the holy convocations. And I'm reading this, and I'm, you know, I'm getting worked up about these prohibitions, these blemishes. I'm thinking, man, we, Yahweh's about to cut us off. And he's telling us, if you want to come in here, you're going to have to toe the line. There's certain requirements, certain standards. Yahweh doesn't lower the bar for you. Hello? We attempt to lower the standards, but you can't do that. And the next thing you find is that he teaches you about these holy convocations which are divine appointments, okay? Specifically talking about the weekly Sabbath and then the Feast of Yahweh, not our feast or the Jews' feast, but his feast. That's what I'm thinking. Is there a connection? 
to these ritual impurities and specifications for entertaining his presence and then attending these holy convocations because couldn't these holy convocations be construed as being in the presence of the king or the husband? Of course. In fact, if you look at this word feast here, look at it here on the screen, it's this word moed. Say that with me. Moed. And it means an appointed place, time, meeting, a sign, or a signal. It comes from the Hebrew word yaad, which means something that's fixed to a point, to betrothed, but it also indicates a set time where one would espouse a wife. So how many of you just really don't feel compelled to attend the holy convocations? Including the Sabbath, beginning with the Sabbath. Hello? It's, it's the time to be a spouse to the husband. Are you seeing this? Yeah. The numeric value here, the mem is 40, vav 6, I am 70, dalit 40 is a total of 120, which are the numbers of years of jubilee seasons allocated to the bride here on the earth. But what I want to point out to you is the individual word picture in that word moed. Can I do that? The mem represents water, specifically the chaotic waters of the womb. The vav represents a connector, the vav man known as Messiah. The I in Hebrew letter I in represents the house of Israel and the Dalit represents the doorway. These holy convocations are the doorway for the Messiah to access the womb of his bride, Israel. Did you see that? And so he's trying to tell you, if you want to meet me here, I'd love for you to meet me here, but before you do, darling, you need to clean up a little bit. you got to be frank with me. Baby, you need to make what? Oh, I'm not going there. You understand what I'm saying? He's trying to be as tactful as he can, but he's trying to tell us, if you want to come to my place, if you want to be betrothed, if you want to be sanctified, set apart, then there's some things we have to do to clean up, to meet the standards. And did you know that Hebrew or Jewish traditions require, I want you to think about this, Jewish tradition, Hebrew tradition, require that the woman marry up in life. Some of you ladies probably just had that. <gasps> <laughs> Prayerfully, you did. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Did you know that these holy convocations were set agriculturally based on the cycles of the moon? They're literally set upon the gestational cycle of the woman who is brought to the presence of her husband. She receives seed. She's in the period of her life where she's fertile, her most, most fertile, and she's able to receive that seed, and then she begins to nurture and incubate that seed for a season. She gets into the seventh month festivals, and it's during the seventh month that you see some natural things happening with the fetus with inside her. It's all about individual intimacy with the king. Each festival reveals an incremental change in the maturation process or purification of the bride who would go into her husband at Sukkot. Now let me ask you something. You remember Proverbs 8.34 when we were talking about the threshold covenant and being charged with standing at the door? Remember that? Did you know that the loins of the man and woman if you want some of you in prospective husbands and wives and wonder why Yahweh commands you to be pure before you get married, we're talking about this for Sukkot. That's our thing, the restoration of the marriage and the family. And in today's society, if you're not considered a virgin, whether you're male or female, I mean, if you are considered a virgin, they, they look kind of skewed you. There's something wrong with you. Maybe you got sugar in your pants. <laughs> Hello, what's wrong with you? You see what I'm saying? You're, li you're literally, in today's society, you're looked down on if you haven't remained chaste and pure. But Yahweh's Torah commands you to guard the threshold. Did you know, if you look at the pattern, that the tabernacle was built in the form of a man, the blood was applied to the doorpost on the house. The house represents the husband and the wife. It would have been a shadow picture, and I'll step where you can see it, of applying the blood up one thigh across the waist, the doorpost and lintel, and down the other thigh. It's this threshold area that it would have been covered by the blood of the lamb. Are you seeing it? We have an admonition. Prospective husbands, 
prospective brides, you're to guard the threshold. You're not to allow anyone other than the one Father has designed for you to entertain the threshold. In fact, the loins of the man and the loins of the woman are the only part of their body that do not belong to them. Did you know that? Now, wait a minute. Can you prove that? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us. Husbands, render due benevolence to your wife. In other words, it says, give what you owe to her. And vice versa. So ladies, if you get upset and you decide to withhold yourself from your husband, you're compromising Torah. Amen. I'm talking about things in the right relationship here. And vice versa. And he says, don't you understand that your body is not yours? And vice versa. So it ha this body... The loins of the man was created in reservation for the woman that he would meet. Her womb was created and reserved. It doesn't belong to her. It's to house the special union that belongs to Yahweh. It was created there. That's why we're told you will not have anyone before my face, any other God. They're described as holy convocations. And that word is kadosh. And it means a set apartness, a sacredness. It means a separation. It literally, these holy convocations are the time when you are publicly bringing yourself with your husband or vice versa and you're going to announce that I belong specifically to this one. I belong to Yahweh. That's what the Sabbath does. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, I've got three more slides, hold on. Therefore, if any man be a Messiah, he is a new creature. Ketesis is the word. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. I'm a new creature. And as a new creature, it tells me that I am to spend my time exclusively with the one who made and owned me. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Next slide. I want you to see the word for Kodesh. It's identical with Strong's number 6945, Kodesh which means a male temple prostitute. A temple prostitute was the one that would, stand, would literally come to the pagan temple and attempt to entice people into their way of life, their particular religious practices, and would give themselves over to those that would become adherents to that particular practice. You see that? The word congregation, convocation is the word mikrah, a convoking, a reading, a recitation. It's a summons. It's a legal procedure when you are declared that you are to appear in court in order to hear who you are and what Yahweh expects to you. They're compulsory. It was not a suggestion that you attend. Yahweh set this in order in this Torah portion to teach you what he expects of you. And listen, as husbands and wives, moms and dads, we have an obligation to teach our children proper. Dating was not intended, young ladies, young men, to be like going down to the used car lot. Amen. Amen. Hello? And you were not judged by how many vehicles you drive. <laughs> And you didn't have the right if the bumper started sagging and it had a few dents and dings and the motor was not operating the way it's supposed to. You didn't have the right to get rid of it. Amen. You're always challenging us as a group of people. Oh, it's easy for me to say I set these standards for someone else. But when it comes down to me and my house, are we going to live it? If I expect to make it into the kingdom then I'm going to live these things. If I don't live these things, can I expect to make it into the kingdom? As for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh. Yeah. The challenge is yours. The gauntlet is applied to you. Lines drawn in the sand. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.